In the first episode of our series about the Trans-Mississippi Theater of the American Civil War, we looked at the start of the war in Missouri. Now the two sides finally clashed in the battles around Boonville and Carthage. Although terrifying for the men who took part, they were small engagements and had not decided the struggle to control Missouri. McCulloch, Price, and Lyon all knew that there would have to be a full-scale battle. The Southerners had a faint hope that another battlefield victory might secure independence, and for Lyon, victory would secure Missouri for the Union and pave the way for an invasion, or in his mind, a liberation of Arkansas. The commanders began to put final touches on their forces in preparation for what both sides likely thought would be the decisive battle for control of Missouri. Lyon's intelligence warned him that the rebels were about to advance on him. While McCulloch struggled with the lack of ammunition and a fragmented command, he had his own problems. Union force in Missouri had shrunk dramatically in the last weeks. Many of Lyon's men had only signed up for three months' service and were therefore within their right to go home whenever they wanted. In early August, he only had 5,868 men at Springfield. Against an advancing rebel force that he estimated, was over 20 to 24,000 strong. He had also been replaced as overall commander in Missouri by the politically appointed and militarily inexperienced John C. Fremont. He wanted Lyon to fight and defeat the enemy quickly in order to make up for the embarrassing defeat at Bull Run and was also to free up troops from Missouri to service in the East. Lyon considered withdrawing from Springfield, but several factors influenced his decision. Lyon believed the approaching enemy, although they outnumbered him, to be of dubious quality. His forces had been successful in every engagement, and only Siegel had suffered a slight setback. His troops were largely far better equipped with modern rifled muskets, and he had plenty of ammunition. On the whole, his force was also better trained. He had 600 regular soldiers from the pre-war army, and the 1st and 2nd Kansas regiments were largely made up of men who had experienced war during the bleeding Kansas years. Springfield and the area around it was also largely made up of loyal Unionists. Lyon did not want to give the impression that he was willing to abandon these to what he considered foreign occupation. Retreating was in any case far from safe. The approaching enemy possessed large numbers of cavalry and in theory they could harass his marching columns or might even succeed in cutting his retreat back to St. Louis. With the combined Confederate and Missouri State Guard forces advancing on Springfield, Lyon decided to move on the enemy. It is not clear whether he intended to fight a full-scale battle or simply wanted to arrest and slow down their forward movement. On the 2nd of August, he moved south along the wire road and set up his men and guns blocking the advance of the enemy close to a place called Doug Springs. A short skirmish was fought between the two sides. The Lion's force eventually routed the advance guard led by James Raines. The skirmish at Doug Springs, or also known as the Rain Scare, had two important consequences. McCulloch wrongly reported that Rain's men were put to flight by a single cannon shot, so he became even more delusioned with the Missouri State Guard troops and threatened to march his men back to Arkansas, but Price persuaded him to stay. While Lyon, on his part, was content with putting the enemy to flight and his self-confidence grew, he withdrew his men back to Springfield to consider his next move. McCulloch's men pursued the Federals, but in the hot weather they failed to force an engagement, and with Lyon's successful retreat to Springfield, McCulloch stopped his men in a valley 10 miles southwest of Springfield, along a small river called Wilson's Creek, on the afternoon of August 9th. For the tired Confederate and Missouri State Guard troops, the valley was a welcome respite. Food was plentiful, and the creek provided enough fresh drinking water for both men and animals. McCulloch did not intend to let his men rest, however. He wanted to force a battle the next day and intended to march his men through the night toward Springfield. At this point, the weather turned against him. During the afternoon, heavy rainfall occurred, and as most of his men had no cartridge pouches and simply carried their paper cartridges in their pockets, he did not want to risk initiating a battle with wet powder. 
Because of this, he cancelled the march towards Springfield. The peaceful valley seemed to have a drowsing effect on both Price and McCulloch. Neither the two generals put up any kind of picket or sentry line, and this would come back to haunt them soon. Although the skirmish at Duck Springs had heartened the lion, he was still unsure of what he should do. The scouts had reported that the enemy force had reached Wilson's Creek and made camp there. It was at this point that a daring plan was offered to him by Franz Siegel. He suggested to Lyon they split up his force and that Lyon would take the bulk of the force and attack the rebels from the north, while Siegel would take a smaller force of about 1,200 men and circle around the enemy and strike them from the south. Siegel proposed leaving 1,000 men in Springfield to guard the supplies and protect any retreat. In order to achieve surprise, he suggested they march through the night in order to strike the enemy at dawn the next day. The plan was risky. The Union forces would have to complete a night march of about 10 miles, and once they engaged the enemy, they would be unable to coordinate and communicate with each other. The plan depended on the much larger force panicking like they had done at Duck Springs, and if the Confederate Missouri State Guard forces did not flee, then it would be likely that their numbers would prove difficult to defeat. Lyon decided that although it was risky, the potential rewards were too good to pass up. Lyon and Siegel set off on the evening of August 9th, and their soldiers marched all night without any major incidents. All things considered, the march went well, and at the dawn hours of August 10th, they had completed the march. As Siegel's and Lyon's forces approached the enemy camp from north and south, they were amazed to find no enemy pickets. It seemed as if the entire enemy camp was sleeping. This reinforced the impression that both commanders had in regards to the quality of the enemy, and they both pressed on and made their final preparations for attack. As the sun was just beginning to rise on the 10th of August, Brigadier General Lyon ordered James Totten's battery to unlimber and open fire on the rows of enemy tents that were in front of them. Surprise was complete. The shells from Totten's 6 and 12 pounder cannons began to explode among the tents of Cawthorn's Missouri cavalry. It was not long before panic was complete and the Missouri State Guard cavalry began streaming to the rear. Opening of fire from Totten's guns served as signal to Siegel in the south that the time was now. He ordered Lieutenant Edward Schutzenbach to open fire with his guns on the Confederate soldiers who were asleep in a field belonging to the Sharp family. For the 1800 men of the 1st Arkansas Cavalry, Brown's Cavalry, Major's Cavalry, 1st Arkansas Mounted Rifles, and the South Kansas Texas Regiment, the awakening they received from the Federal artillery mimicked that experienced by Cawthon's men just a few minutes before, and panic spread quickly among the men. Although some of the officers of the various regiments attempted to regain order, it seemed like a fool's errand. Siegel was happy with the results and ordered the 3rd and 5th Missouri Infantry forward. They were supported by the 2nd U.S. Dragoons, while the 1st U.S. Cavalry were on the other side of Wilson's Creek to secure his right flank. His men advanced without any incidents, until they reached the edge of the sharp field, when they were met with small arms fire. Brown and Churchill had managed to rally their regiments and they were ready to contest the enemy advance. The soldiers fought dismounted and they managed to delay Siegel's men a full half hour before Schutzenbach's guns again began to fire on them. The advancing Union infantry coupled with exploding shells was too much, and the two cavalry regiments began to retreat. Siegel's men moved on across the field, and when they neared the Sharp family house, Siegel spotted more enemy cavalry who intended to delay him further. A quick bombardment from the artillery again sent the enemy into retreat, and Siegel's men pressed onwards. His battle line arrived at the Sharp farm just around 8 o'clock. From here, he could see Alliance troops engaged in battle, but he decided to stop his men. Why he did so is still unclear. Perhaps he thought Lyon should fight his way to him, or perhaps he intended to rest his men for a short while before continuing. When Siegel had begun his advance in the south, Lyon had done the same in the north. The panic among Cawthorn's cavalry was just what Lyon had hoped to see. 
He ordered the 1st Kansas and the 1st and 2nd Missouri regiments to advance and occupy a hill called Oak Hill. After these, regiments followed the rest of his men. He wanted to occupy the hill, place his artillery there and continue onwards with supporting fire. As his men neared the crest of the hill, they were met by scattered fire from elements of Cawthorn's retreating units. It was primarily men from Hunter's cavalry who had been organized to make a stand. The 300 dismounted cavalrymen were greatly outnumbered, but it was unclear to Lyon's men just how many they faced, and officers became hesitant. After a firefight that lasted between 20 to 30 minutes, Hunter's men withdrew. Lyon's troops continued and occupied the hill, and below they could see the rest of the enemy camps. And it all seemed to be going according to plan. So far, Lyon's attack in the north and Siegel's attack in the south had routed about one-fifth of the Confederate and Missouri State Guard army, and most of the rest were now in disarray. In General McCulloch's headquarters, on the other side of Wilson's Creek, the morning had been quiet. He had resolved to allow his men a few more hours of sleep before they were to move on towards Springfield. When the Federals attacked, he was busy eating breakfast with his staff officers. Just before 6 o'clock, he received the first report from Cawthorn's cavalry that something had happened around Oak Hill. This did not disturb him too much, as he believed the inexperienced Missouri soldiers had overacted, and he simply answered that he would check out the situation for himself later. His headquarter was also located in an acoustic shadow, so he did not hear the noise of battle from the other side of the creek. This phenomenon happened on several Civil War battlefields, and Wilson Creek was merely the first example. Gradually, however, more soldiers arrived with the same message. The army is under attack. McCulloch rode quickly across Wilson's Creek to see what was going on. When McCulloch arrived across the creek, what met him was a scene of utter confusion, and the whole army seemed to be in disarray. He quickly spotted General Price, and for all the reserved feeling that he had towards Price, he could not but value him at that moment. In the chaos, Price showed himself from his very best side, he was seemingly fearless and was busily engaged in organizing the men. His calm and determined manner rallied many soldiers, who had been completely panic-stricken just moments before. Despite efforts from McCulloch and Price to rally the fleeing soldiers, Lyon had placed James Totten's battery on top of Oak Hill, and shells began to explode among the inexperienced soldiers. The effects of artillery fire on green troops cannot be underestimated, and the situation was becoming critical. It was at this time that Woodruff's battery of Bartlett Pierce's brigade made their mark on the battle. William Edward Woodruff, who commanded the battery, had decided the evening before that he would leave his guns limbered, and decided not to remove the horses. This allowed the battery to be moved instantly when the battle began the following morning. Woodruff identified the enemy on top of Oak Hill, moved his guns to a hill on the opposite side of Wilson's Creek, close to the farm belonging to the Wien family. His gunners quickly unlimbered and calculated the range and began delivering accurate counter-battery fire against Totten's battery, and in the official battle report they would later be identified as a key to the Confederate victory. Woodruff's four smoothbore cannons began to punish the Federal artillery, and many Union gunners were killed or wounded. The fire from the Confederate guns forced the Union gunners to respond, but they never regained the upper hand in the firefight. Is one of the few examples from the Civil War when Confederate gunners outmatched their Union counterparts in an artillery duel. Woodruff's actions gave McCulloch and Price the break they needed, and the two generals agreed on a plan of action. McCulloch would gather troops to beat back Siegel in the south, while Price would rally as many men as he could and halt Lyon. If possible, he would try to recapture Oak Hill. Price did not waste any time, and already by about 6.30, he launched an attack on Oak Hill. It's not clear which units took part in the action, but most likely it was executed by men from the State Guard. The men advanced slowly up the steep hill. In the underbrush, it was hard to maintain any battle order, especially for the Green troops. The attack was met by the 1st of Kansas and the 1st and 2nd Missouri. The two sides exchanged volleys for about half an hour before the guardsmen withdrew back down the hill. Many of them lacked ammunition to continue the firefight for much longer. Lyon tried to urge his men to pursue, but when they began to advance down the hill, they were met by increasing enemy fire and fell back to the top. Price had succeeded in preventing Lyon from pushing any further, and he was constantly receiving reinforcements. 
Lyon was gradually acting more and more like a regimental commander and spent his time in the front line where he tried to encourage the troops by his personal example. This left the leadership of the Union troops more and more to Major Samuel D. Sturgis. Sturgis was, like Lyon, a West Point officer. He would be active on many Civil War battlefields with mixed results, but that day at Wilson's Creek, he rose to the challenge of command. Sturgis reinforced the Union line with the 2nd Kansas Regiment on the right and the 1st Iowa on the left. He also saw the damage that was being done by Woodruff's battery, and he decided that the enemy battery would have to be eliminated. He grabbed Captain Palmer, who was in command of four companies of the 1st U.S. Infantry, and ordered the captain to cross Wilson's Creek and silence the enemy battery. Palmer did as he was ordered, and his men began crossing the creek in the area around Wilson's Mill. His movement, however, was quickly spotted by Woodruff, who recognized the danger. He sent word to General McCulloch and asked for support. McCulloch sent two regiments to support the battery, the 3rd Louisiana of Colonel Louis Hebert and the 2nd Arkansas Mounted Rifles led by James McIntosh. Both of these officers were West Point educated. The 3rd Louisiana had been relentlessly drilled by Hebert into one of the best regiments in the entire Confederate Army. McIntosh was brave and rather reckless, and the 2nd Arkansas Mounted Rifles were undisciplined, but highly enthusiastic. These two regiments arrived at the edge of the field, belonging to the Dixon family. Both Hebert's infantry and McIntosh's dismounted troopers took up the position behind a fence. Palmer's men had made their way through most of the wheat field, but visibility was highly limited, and they could not see the two enemy regiments that were facing them. Suddenly, they were hit by a full volley, and many fell dead or wounded. Both the Confederate regiments carried mostly smoothbore weapons, but they still inflicted substantial damage. The professional Union soldiers dutifully returned fire as best they could, but it was an uneven fight. A bear extended his right flank and his men began pouring enfilading fire on Palmer's outnumbered men. After about 30 minutes, discipline began to break down, and the wounded Captain Palmer ordered his men to withdraw. The impetus McIntosh saw his chance and ordered his men to charge after them. With a rebel yell, his men surged forward and suddenly found themselves in position where they could flank the Federal position on top of Oak Hill. This was short-lived, however. Sturgis had brought Dubois' battery on the top of a hill, and it began firing shells at McIntosh's exposed soldiers. His men did not endure the fire well, and he ordered them back to the fence. McCulloch then ordered McIntosh to remain at the fence in case the Federals attempted further action against Woodruff's battery, while he ordered the 3rd Louisiana to accompany him to the south of the battlefield. As Plummer had failed to silence the battery, the cannonade continued, and Price had also brought forward Gibor's battery on the south side of the hill, while Bledsoe's battery was on its way. Lyon's men thus endured an increasing volume of enemy fire. Lyon and Sturgis both knew that there would be further attacks on the hill, and they did not have to wait long. Already at 7.30, a new attack was launched by Price. He had brought forward more ammunition, and the attacking force had been reinforced with more regiments. It is likely that this attack was undertaken by Wingo's, Foster's, Kelly Burbridge's, Hughes' and Thronton's regiments of the Missouri State Guard. Price saw to the coordination of the attack line, and like Lyon, he led his men from the front. With renewed spirits, the Missouri State Guard troops stormed up the hill while they exchanged fire with the Federals on the top. The two sides fought at an ever-closing distance, and eventually they collided in bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat. During this attack, Lyon had his horse killed under him, and he was wounded two times. Despite this, he continued to stay in the front line, encouraging his men by his example. The center of the Union lines buckled during this attack, but it did not break. Eventually, the Missouri State Guard troops were exhausted, and they fell back down the hill. Price saw to it that the withdrawal was orderly, and like Lyon, he too had been wounded. Soldiers from both sides began referring to Oak Hill as Bloody Hill, as the south side was covered in dead and wounded men. Sturgis was sure that although the Union troops had managed to beat back the attack, he knew there would be more. He could see that further enemy reinforcements were constantly arriving. On his part, he brought forward all the men he could find and reinforced the front line with Steele's 2nd U.S. Infantry. 
both Lion and Sturgis were starting to wonder, where was Siegel? At this time, Siegel was still at the Sharp Farm when Price's second attack was beaten back. He could see the fight on Oak Hill and had briefly ordered Schutzenbach's battery to open fire. It had not taken long before he became nervous that he was firing on friendly troops and ordered Schutzenbach to cease fire. When Siegel stopped at the Sharp Farm, he decided against an extensive picket chain in front of the battle line. He selected one man, Corporal Charles Tutt, to act as sentry for his entire brigade. A little after 8 o'clock, General McCulloch rode right into the sights of the Union Corporal. His habit of personal reconnaissance almost cost him his life. Before the Union soldier could pull the trigger, he was shot by Confederate Corporal Henry Gentiles. Kolok thanked Gentiles and complimented his shooting, which had undoubtedly saved his life, and then ordered his men to push forward. The shooting of the lone sentry left Siegel's brigade blind to the massing numbers of Confederate troops that were heading towards them. Around 8.30, Siegel could see a grey-clad regiment heading for his left flank. And from the distance, he assumed it was either the 1st Iowa or one of the two Kansas regiments of Lyon's forces. All these three regiments wore gray uniforms. He was, however, mistaken. It was the 3rd Louisiana who had just quick marched down from beaten back Plummer's men in the north. Siegel's illusion was shattered when the regiment fired a volley from about 45 meters away that shattered his left flank. Siegel put himself in danger to rally his men, but more Confederate troops soon joined the fight. The Federals were bombarded by Reed's Arkansas battery as well. When Hebert ordered the 3rd Louisiana to charge, it was too much for Siegel's men, and they fled from the field. The 3rd Louisiana captured five of Schutzenbach's six guns. McCulloch had secured the southern part of the battlefield, and with Siegel's defeat and rout, all the Confederate and Missouri State Guard forces could be concentrated on Bloody Hill. On top of Bloody Hill, both Lyon and Sturgis were completely oblivious to Siegel's defeat in the south. They continued to hold their ground, believing that help would arrive soon. Many of the Union soldiers were running low on both ammunition and will to fight. Lyon did what he could to encourage the men. He attempted to regain the initiative and tried to lead a forward push. In this attempt that happened between 9 and 9.30, the already twice wounded Lyon was shot again. His last words were supposedly, I am killed. Sturgis was now completely alone in command, but despite everything he decided to hold his ground on the top of the hill. About one hour after Lyon's death, Price, McCulloch and Pierce were ready to launch a combined attack. The regiments from the last charge were sent forward again, but they were reinforced by the 3rd and 5th Arkansas. Whiteman's Infantry Brigade, the South Kansas Texas Regiment and elements of the 1st Arkansas Mounted Rifles. The Confederate and Missouri State Guard forces extended their left flank around Sturgis's right and put his entire position under immense pressure. The rebel yell went up and they charged Bloody Hill for a third time. They were greeted by heavy musket and rifle fire from the Union soldiers, and once again the two forces collided in bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat on the top. Men fought with anything and everything they had available, bayonets, musket butts, bowie knives or their bare hands. On the far right of the Union line, the two Confederate cavalry regiments went forward in a charge towards the 2nd Kansas. The Confederate cavalry rushed forward knee to knee in a Napoleonic charge. The 2nd Kansas held their fire until the rebel horsemen were as little as 20 yards away. The subsequent volley shattered the Confederate charge and sent them fleeing to the rear. Neither side had figured out how to use cavalry effectively in this new era. In the center, the fight ebbed back and forth. But in the end, through almost superhuman determination, the Confederates were once again forced back down the hill. For the Union soldiers, it was a hollow victory. The losses had been horrific, and most of the men were now out of ammunition, and Sturgis knew that his men could do no more. Another attack would break them. He ordered a withdrawal back to Springfield, which was carried out in good order despite a half-hearted 4th Confederate attack. The Confederate commanders did not give any immediate pursuit. Their army was now exhausted as well, and practically out of ammunition, and their losses had been hard as well. When the ordinary Confederate and Missouri State Guard soldiers saw that the Union had begun to retreat and pull away from the field, they realized that victory was theirs. 
Loud cheers went up among the men, which could be heard clearly from a substantial distance. At an improvised Confederate field hospital, the mortally wounded Colonel Waitman, who had taken part in the attacks on Bloody Hill, whispered his last words. Thank God. The Battle of Wilson's Creek was over. There have been disputes about who won the Battle of Wilson's Creek, both at the time and by prosperity. Sturges argued that since his line had never been breached, his forces had inflicted substantial casualties, and he had retreated voluntarily, he had won a tactical victory. If one examines the battle in more traditional terms, there is a clear winner. The Confederate and Missouri State Guard forces held the field at the end of the day, and the Union forces lost more troops and a much higher percentage. Siegel's force had been routed, and he had lost five of his six cannons. An unknown Confederate soldier described the Battle of Wilson's Creek in the following terms. Some of the best blood in the land was being spilled as if it were ditch water. Lion fought like a demon. Price charged time and again up the slope, only to be repulsed by the Federals lying on the crest. The Federals even more often broke over the crest of the hill and flowed down like an inundation of fire and were thrown back. Perhaps one of the reasons for the debate is due to the fact that the strategic consequences of the battle did not favor the victor on the field in the long term. The day after the battle, Confederate cavalry advanced towards Springfield and found the town abandoned by Union forces, and they hoisted their battle colors on the roof of the courthouse. After this, however, McCulloch and Price argued harshly about how to proceed. Price wanted McCulloch to help him liberate the entire state, and urged an advance towards St. Louis. McCulloch, on his part, argued against this. He considered his work in Missouri to be done for now, supply lines were virtually non-existent, and their combined forces had little ammunition. McCulloch guessed that the enemy would receive substantial reinforcements, and after the battle he had an even lower regard for the quality of the Missouri State Guard. They could not agree, and in the end, McCulloch marched his and Pierce's men back to Arkansas, where the Arkansas militia were integrated into the Confederate Army. Price and McCulloch would never see eye to eye after this. Price felt that McCulloch had abandoned him, and McCulloch thought Price was an incompetent army leader, who was simply in command because of politics. In a letter sent to Richmond, McCulloch would write, We have little to hope or expect from the people of this state. The force now in the field is undisciplined and led by men who are mere politicians. Not a soldier among them to control and organize this mass of humanity. The Missouri forces are in no condition to meet an organized army, nor will they ever be whilst under the present leaders. The two men developed a hatred for each other. Each would in turn later travel to Richmond to have the other removed, and they could scarcely be in the same room, despite the victory they shared at Wilson's Creek. Price went on without McCulloch, and he pushed into Midwestern Missouri, further swelling his ranks and improving his forces. He fought skirmishes with small federal units and would eventually lay siege to Lexington on the 3rd of September. After a siege that lasted a week, with some imaginative siege tactics that involved large hemp bales, the city and its 3,500-man garrison surrendered to Price on the 20th. It would be the zenith of Price's success in Missouri, and Claiborne Jackson delivered a speech to the Union prisoners in which he shamed them as invaders. Soon after, Jackson was able to assemble parts of the state delegation, and a majority of these voted for secession on October 28th. One month later, the Confederacy admitted Missouri as its 12th state, promptly added another star and a flag to honor the new member state. In practice, however, this meant little. St. Louis was firmly under federal control, as was two-thirds of the state. Union forces in Missouri grew steadily, and by late 1861, Price's situation was becoming untenable. This has been our second video in our series about the Trans-Mississippi Theater of the American Civil War. Make sure to subscribe to catch the next one. We'll see you then.